greatest nation of the realms no one knows exists. It's the unofficial and fairly accurate model for that walled off and heavily guarded section of Polaron. If you didn't live within those walls, you weren't likely to have ever heard it <laughs> or have a reason to believe it. However, those that live or do business there are fully aware of the truth of it, and they are proud of both the important place they hold within the realms and the fact that their import is not known by those very realms. It allows for all the benefits and wealth without the fear of being the target of politics from such wider realms. We had enough of that kind of trouble all on our own. With our own. I took a long pull of the pipe as the woman who asked about my knowledge of old Polaron and my time there sat in the chair that I had indicated. Smiling, I began in earnest as I sat in my own recliner. From the outside, the 40-foot-high walls that separate the rest of Polaron from roughly a 30-square-mile district of what appears to be two- and three-story buildings. Maybe there's a few tens of thousands that live or work there. From above, they can be seen sometimes through the many layers of fog and smoke from the factories and other workspaces at the old city. These clouds of fog and smoke always hang low to the building tops and are nearly a solid barrier most of the time, with only the glow of diffused lights brightening it in patches. These clouds and smoke are kept contained by those high outer walls of old Polaron, essentially sealing in the entire area beneath it. <laughs> like many things in Old Polaron, this is a deception. The Old City borders, in fact, contain a pocket space, a fold in reality, one in which a massive city within a city is kept. More than 40 cubes, each a mile long, wide, as well as high, Spaced out and arranged into nine columns across 17 vertical levels. That's Old Polaron. Each cube is practically a small city unto itself. With housing, commercial, industrial, and mercantile venues and systems in place. And, with the exception of ninth level, that's the only level where all nine columns have a cube present. Each is left to handle their affairs and matters on their own for the most part. Instead of tens of thousands of people, it's closer to 10 million residents. Spread across the cubes, of course. Well over that if you count the webs and their undocumented population. Each cube is bound by the overall rules and laws of the city of Polaron, of course. But in most civil matters, the recognized mayor of each cube is given a large amount of latitude in what can and cannot be done within his or her cube. What groups are allowed to rent what facilities and how much they are charged for its use. These are but a simple example of the powers of the mayors. Most mayors are elected locally in some manner or another, and then confirmed by ninth level. And some are appointed and installed by ninth level, when, in their opinion, the welfare of the cube is not being properly tended by those currently in or near power. Ninth level is the official administration and governmental center of Old Polaron, and it is from there that most of the intercube affairs of any magnitude or importance are addressed. The old Polaron prison is said to be in the center cube of ninth level, and from all accounts, it is not a pleasant place to stay. 
The main centers for most governmental functions that are needed for Old Polaron can be found on 9th level. Large-scale maintenance and construction teams, various courts and administrators, as well as the bulk of local law enforcement. While well, each cube has a handful of sheriffs or constables on a per semi-permanent basis, all under the provisional direction of a marshal who reports to the mayor. As with most places in the realms, these are not intended to handle more than minor local matters. When events of a nature beyond this occur, the mayors or their marshals are able to request the assistance of the various experts and specialists of ninth level to come in and render assistance. My artificial right lens, the replacement for our eye lost to foolishness, noted my audience was becoming weary of my foundation lane, beginning to cast glances at the many crystals and knickknacks that festoon my parlor. And thus, I continue to what she is no doubt interested in. And that's where I come in. Or, more accurately, that is where I used to come in. Almost a century as an investigator. Most of it as a lead or primary investigator. And I was used to being called in to solve every sort of crime you could imagine. Murders, theft, extortions, even things as seemingly minor as unauthorized energy taps. But, to be fair to the taps case, it was a significant power being stolen and rerouted, accounting for nearly 2% of the cube in questions total, in fact. We were also the ones called into to look into the webs those unofficial and normally unpatrolled areas in the spaces between the cubes. You see, each cube is connected and supported to those around it via large segmented bonds. And in the gaps on each level where a cube is not present for a column, these bonds crisscross to aid in both the greater structure of old Polaron, as well as to act as transit and power transfer between the cubes, supplementing the direct bond between each adjacent cube. This crisscross has been built on and up over the years, with vast lengths of cables and wires interlinking and spread out for buildings and other constructions to be made upon them. From a distance, it appears as a vast spider's web in the hollows between cubes, hence the name. Her light sling forward made it clear that she wanted to know more, her eyes back to focusing on me instead of my decor. The webs, for the most part, are lawless regions where those that wish to be left alone or unobserved choose to make their home. In the upper eight levels, they are less dense and not nearly as heavily built up as those found amongst the low eight, and this is due to the affluence and wealth of upper eight. Its residents are able to pay for regular patrols to ensure flying traffic is both safe from bandits and shipjackers as well as to keep any expansion of the webs from interfering with the many flight paths in and out of those areas. The webs on the low eight, by contrast, only tend to have one or two main routes for air traffic, but they have any number of sky alleys. Tight and extremely confusing passageways barely large enough for a standard sky ship to traverse comfortably. There are local pathfinders who are more than willing to guide pilots along the most current and safest of paths for a modest fee. Otherwise, only the main routes are generally safe to use, and while they do allow ready access to the main docks or entrance of a cube, 
the use of sky alleys were more often than not. Get a ship far closer to where it actually needs to be, and faster than milling through the main sky docks. Normally, major issues within the webs are handled by the Dragon Knights, and unless someone like me's followed a crime or had an investigation take us into the webs, it is reports of raiders shipjackers that gain attention from ninth level, and thus the dispatching of a response team. When it comes to these sorts of issues, nothing quite has the impact of a team of Dragon Knights flying in to absolutely ruin some shipjacker or raider's day in blooms of various energy and overwhelming violence. However, as I said, Investigations in the cubes lead to the nearby webs often, and thus, if you've been doing the job long at all, you'll get to know the people and the groups amongst them. Most web folk, in my opinion, are good people, only wanting to avoid the restrictions and the costs that one cube or another may have. Many actually work in the cubes living out in the webs to save on costs while enjoying good pay and other benefits without having a default rent or rule set set by a mayor. The only cost re that's regular in the webs is that of securing energy for your home or its Chris Tech features. Thanks to the various collectives and benefactors that make up the communities of the webs, only rarely is that power stolen or not paid for. While there are protection rackets that impose a sort of rent on the web folk, this is often made as part and parcel of an agreement for regular and constant power, and are often far cheaper rates than in the cubes themselves, but come with a very real benefit of protection from local ne'er-do-wells as well as knowing that the stuffed shirts of ninth level aren't going to be concerned about or even know that you are there, much less be able to find you. Of course, I haven't seen the current state of things. I've been retired for the better part of two centuries at this point. After a century in the Investigators Guild and a career consisting of several cases of some import, I managed to retire with full honors. A rarity, as most in my line of work would either <laughs> meet a grisly end after crossing the wrong person, or be discharged for failures of duty, most commonly corruption and malfeasance. Alas, arches an eyebrow looking at me. Perhaps in disbelief such things happen, or perhaps that I would speak of it. Now don't get me wrong, the pay is good, but nothing to cheer about. Benefits are alright, but are limited in their usefulness for someone who is so often not in their home cube. Neither is to the point that the temptation to pad one's wallet with Extracurricular employment opportunities is ever negated in any real way. I always saw that as a intentional, a hidden test of moral and character. I figured once I retired as I did, with all honors and commendations intact and not a black mark on my record, that I would have received some gift or memento to celebrate reward my steadfastness. Nothing. Not a single copper beyond that stipulated as pension. Not even a note of appreciation. More than enough for me to make the move back home to the sparkling halls of Stone Gem and busy myself with forays into crystal craft and rune carving, however. I looked at the woman, an elf of some minor house, and smiled. She had arrived not an hour before and had made it clear that she had been looking for me, 
Gargon Stone Shaper. She further had explained that she was seeking my services to investigate why her contact, a family member by the sound of it, had stopped responding to missives and letters. Elves, they are like dancers with their words, with truth often concealed in inference and left between the lines of eloquently delivered and articulated state. And this was especially true when matters of face or honor were at stake. What made it more interesting is the fact that this last chose to seek me out at all. Sure, retiring as I did was rare, but there must have been any number of elves of a similar stripe she could have sought out locally. Again. This points to it being a matter of elven status and honor. But either way, this young lady was giving nothing away, being concise and economical with her words. She explained she wanted me to find out what happened to her contact and resolve any outstanding debts or other issues they might be in trouble for, then escort the contact back to Avlin. So, that's why she'd asked for my past there. M my former position ensured I would be able to access old Polaron without the piles of paperwork and fees that a hunter or other outsider would have to deal with. This was most likely the main reason for her seeking someone like me out. That access alone is worth half the fee. When she asked what I would charge to take the job on, I quoted her an outrageous amount. I was retired after all, and this had the ring of trouble. Mmm, five plat a day. Twice that if I have to deal in the webs or with ninth level. The elf didn't blink, only nodding for me to continue. Three times that if I have to go to the upper eight or deal with the docks in wider city. Plus expenses, of course, and those are to be accounted for and is settled weekly. She only nodded and withdrew a sheath of papers bound in leather. Setting it on my desk, she then pulled out a smaller package wrapped in leather and set it down on top of the papers, and then slid the stack towards me with a wry smile. Taking the smaller package and opening it slightly, I was stunned. Five plaques of platinum, all neatly set together and minted by different nations. Five million standard gold in the palm of my hand. It was more than I had ever earned in all my years and all for essentially wrangling a wayward family member. The ring of trouble indeed. The question is, what kind? As I looked up, I noticed she was already gone, the door to my home slowly closing behind her. A slip of paper between the plaques with the Trebucom address to send all updates and receipts was the only method of contact she had left. Other than the address of a house in Avlin, I was to escort the wayward one to once I had found him. The sheath of papers was a fairly detailed dossier on her contact and what was known of his situation until he had stopped replying. Looking it over, I sighed. His home was in center cube of upper three. Aristocrats and nobility everywhere once you get that high, each playing their games with and against each other. This was going to be trouble, I knew it. But for five million gold, probably shouldn't expect anything less. Best to get moving. I have to pack my things and prepare to head back to the greatest nation the realm doesn't know exists. And here my perceptive patrons 
regular visitors, and new guests of the library is where I ask you to join in and shape the story. Our protagonist, Derogon Stoneshaper, a dwarf of keen eye, mind, and a keener artificial eye, has just been retained with an exorbitant retainer to find a wayward elf in the vast sprawl that is Old Polaron. As he prepares to begin his work, I ask you, what is the condition of his quarry? Choose from one of the three options and put your choice in the comments below, as well as voting on the poll at griffinslibrary.locals.com. Each vote will be counted after two weeks and used to shape the story in its next installment. It should be noted that votes on locals will have twice the weight of votes cast elsewhere, as a thank you to my perceptive patrons there. With that out of the way, here are your three options, along with the two or three letter abbreviation that you should vote with in your comments. Please leave any additional comment a line or two below your vote to make tabulation easier on me. Thank you. Now, your options. Option 1. In Custody, or I-C, Indigo Charlie. Darragon's target stopped replying because he has run afoul of local law enforcement and has been arrested. Perhaps Darragon's former service will aid him in securing the target's release, or it could make it worse as current officials may look poorly on a retiree interfering within their work. Again, that is I.C. or Indigo Charlie for in custody. Option 2. On the Run or O.T.R. Oscar Tango Romeo. His target is unable to escape from Old Polaron or make contact due to needing to hide from one group or another, and they cannot break silence or risk discovery and swift consequences, moving from one safe house to another, trying to stay ahead of his pursuers, and potentially Stone Shaper as well. Again, that is O-T-R, Oscar, Tango, Romeo. For on the run. And finally, option three. Runs no more. Or R N M. Romeo November Mike. Stone Shaper's target has been caught by the forces that are chasing him and is either dead or being held for another purpose. Darragon would need to not only find who took his quarry, but where they had him and how to recover him. Remember, that is R-N-M, Romeo, November, Mike, for runs no more, if you choose to vote for this option. So make your voice heard and help shape the story. Again, votes will be tabulated after the two weeks of this entry's release on YouTube and Rumble, so don't delay in casting your vote, be it in the comments below or at the poll at my locals. Don't forget to be sure to place any additional comment a line or two beneath your vote to make things added up easier. Thank you. One last time, that is I see or Indigo Charlie for In Custody. O-T-R Oscar. Tango Romeo for On The Run. Or finally, R-N-M. Romeo November Mike for Runs No More. Perceptive Patrons regular visitors, and new guests of the library. 
I do hope you've enjoyed this first entry in Dargan's story, and look forward to seeing it evolve with your help and votes. Until you next make your way back to the library for your next entry of Intro to the Realms, I have been, as always, the recorder, and I thank you for your time, your interest, and of course your support of both Griffin's Library and the Realms of Jamamar. By the Nine and Four, be well, take care of yourselves, and each other. If you'd like to contribute to the further exploration and explanation of the realms, please consider leaving a comment, a like, and sharing the video around. I read all the comments and make efforts to reply to each. Thank you for helping to grow the channel and know I look forward to each and every one of your comments. Other methods of support can be found in the channel's description. Thank you for watching.